Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today in our global dine and wine. And for all of you who are always following in following off in our um, global dining events, we have decided to to have the food, the country food focus event every two months, every yeah, two months, and then. In the middle, we we'll just put a, an industry focus event. And this time, with this time, we, we picked wine, um, but it could be coffee, it could be chocolate, it could be something more specific to an industry rather than to a country. Um, that way, just to diversify a little bit on the format of the event. And so today, we have um, invited um, three people that are working closely with with um, with wine. Um, the first one is Yuka Nagasone. Yuka is actually um, someone that's an expert in, in digital marketing, um, e-commerce, and she's helping companies with their international plans. But we learned in a recent event that she's actually working a lot with the wine in Spain, and basically helping um, local producers to get their wine into Japan. And so I would like to, to give the floor first to Yuka. If, um, Yuka, if you can share with us for five minutes a little bit of your experience with wine yeah. and, and basically, I guess you can cover more into the, the Spanish wine and, and more from the region. That would be great. Cesar? Thank you very much. Okay. Cesar, yes. just as a thought, given you know, it's a small group, does it make sense to just quickly go around the room and see what people yeah. are drinking? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'd, I'd sure. like to know, I see KC's got a wine. I think uh, uh, Jeff has got water, given that he has a meeting coming up. But what, what are you drinking, um, KC? And this is Pinot Noir from Santa Barbara. It's a small winery called Alfonso Current. Uh, he's, he's an old Italian fellow, and she's a younger Irish girl. <laughs> You're from Santa Barbara, right? Or you've got exactly. a connection? Yeah. So yeah. Beautiful. Wherever Jeff, I go, I travel with lots of wine. <laughs> Jeff, if you had your choice, what would you be drinking right oh, now? Oh, here, I have my empty glass. So I, I do wine tastings uh, probably every week or so, and I, do, I have lots of old wines. So I did, I, can I share one screen for one second of a picture of some more taste wines I did from six of us a week ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Please. Sure, hang on one sec. I do a lot of fun tastings. Um, <laughs> so hang on. Uh, where did I just... There we go. So this was one, there were six of us and uh, I opened up the Otis wine. So there's uh, mostly uh, 80s, including, uh, and uh, the one I opened up because I had a Psalm with me, I did not known who was like an expert in German and Austrian Cabernets. And so he had opened up these 80 ones and I had a 76 Kerner, which is the one third over from the left, which drank beautifully. And I was like, I don't know much about it. I figure I'd never meet anybody who actually knows much about this and he knew everything about it. So. Uh, I do a lot of old wines all the time, and I'll be uh, hosting a bunch of people. How do I stop my, hang on. Stop sharing screen. How do I do that here? Did I share, I hope? Did, did my picture share, by the way? Yes, it did. Okay, now we see your Facebook to, page. Yeah, I just need to get rid of. Uh, so, do Jeff, I, of I don't drink a lot of old wines because my clients give me a lot of new wines, mm -hmm. but I had one the other night that's maybe 15 years old and it just tasted old is there is there a, a better way to say that that it just tasted old <laughs> well what was it and then it's not all wines age i drink lots of it, i'm it bringing was, it's, i'm bringing the hill for, for my wine California reception wine. tomorrow night in 89 ridge geyserville which should be great to, taking everyone to ridge saturday morning yeah and i have 70 ridges that drink beautifully still like 73s and all that this, good stuff. This was an 05 Jerry Lore cab and it just tasted old. I mean, there wasn't anything wrong with it. It just tasted old. Oh, it maybe just wasn't, you know, it has to be cellared properly. I have to, I've had wine lockers since 83. Okay. Uh, and my wife doesn't drink wine. So therefore I have old wine. There you go. Uh, it helps, but I have a lot of, so I'm a good person to know because I'm happy to open up wine and share. And okay, I need yeah. to but open I, up two bottles of wine. How's that I sound? opened a 78 Mirasu Beaujolais which, okay. you know, it's not supposed to last more than about an hour. And it tasted yeah, exactly. amazing. The kiwi fruit and the, and the mango tasted like it was bottled yesterday. It was incredible. Um, mm. I opened up not long ago an 82 Sauvignon Blanc J. Carey Vineyards. Mm. Long well, as you know, vineyard yeah. doesn't even, and by the way, if 
right out of the bottle, 1982, you would have never guessed it was an old Sauvignon Blanc, let alone from the, you know, anything that was even more than three, four years old. So you never right. know. Um, and as and I remember, color that, was, was that, like, wasn't an, that wasn't an expensive wine back in the day. Uh, it was their, one of their signatures was their Sauvignon okay. Blanc and Merlot's. Uh, Jake, Jake, Jake Vintage was a Santa Barbara winery. I'm just showing everybody I know little of wine. Um, <laughs> little Very good. Hey, uh, how about you, Yuka? Are, what are you drinking? It's, I'm it's drinking, drinking wine drinking time there in Barcelona. Yeah, it's um, it's almost uh, yeah seven uh, fifteen. Uh, this is uh, one of the sparkling wines that I'm exporting, and this is um, rosé. Uh, or organic and vegan. vegan. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. It's a uh, Spanish, so, Spanish wine? Yeah, it's it's from the wine, uh, winery. I mean, this is what I'm exporting. Okay. And um, Cava Estruc. Mm -hmm. And it's Rosé. So this Fantastic. Uh, brings up an interesting question here for, for you yes. and everybody else is this whole organic thing. So um, I didn't realize that we put animal proteins in the wine, we used to put in, we, yes, yeah. just a second, we used to put in egg whites as a fining agent, but yeah. pretty much now, um, I don't think anybody puts in egg whites. So isn't all wine officially? No, vegan? no, 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 no. That's, okay. that's the reason why this seller decided to get the label of vegan. Uh, because it's a little worse than egg white egg because in Spanish production, some people use to some people use a uh, cow blood to clean the residue of fermentation. Okay. So I'm not talking about wine. I'm talking about sparkling wine because, um, of course, it doesn't. This doesn't use egg white, and this right. doesn't use cow cow blood. Instead, they're using something from, let's say, seaweed <laughs> okay. to clean up. But so, you know, the other problem we have is that if mm. you use mechanical harvesters, you get bugs and things like that in your wine. Mm. So yeah. um, how, do you, how, how does a vegan wine make sure that there's no bugs in the ultimate product? I don't know. But the answer, I don't know. I'm going to ask. <laughs> but you know what? Not me. But there's several, I know several Japanese agents, wine agents here in the region. And one of them is going really all in to the, the how do you say it in English? Ancestral, it's, it's an old method. Yeah, like you, yeah you, you don't even know until you open it, you really don't know what's going to come up. Right? Right. And she's exporting this. I mean, importing it in Japan. So I, I really don't know how they do that. Uh, I just, yeah. Is there any, we, we got to keep moving, guys. Uh, is yeah. there anybody else drinking any wine that they'd like to share? Well, I'm, drinking, I'm drinking some wine, dog, as well. Oh, I'm you are? Okay. Some, some Albarino. Albarino, I love Albarino. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's this from from Galicia, Spain, which is where where our new contact from the UK is based. Uh, what? The one who, who that who can join us today, but who's we got we got a new contact in the UK. Well, from the UK that's based in, in Galicia, Spain, and and he's so focused on wine. He was oh, so he's day. he's in Galicia. He's in Galicia. Yes, hey, we grow Albarino mm. bridal grapes and make Albarino in California in Santa Barbara mm. County. Yes. These people, these people make a great Albarino. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All world. Go figure. Uh, anybody else have another wine? Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, Gloria, what are you drinking? <laughs> okay, it's brunch time here in Phoenix. So my preference would be champagne with orange <laughs> juice, which would be a mimosa. Okay. But since I'm not having that this morning, my second daytime brunchy type thing is to freeze grapes, red grapes. 
and to put them in the bottom of a glass. There are some under here, you can't see them. Yes. But it gets the temperature, you know, you serve red wine room temperature, but you don't really want to refrigerate it, get it too cold. But if you take a tablespoon of frozen grapes and put it at the bottom, mm. and then you fill it with like right here, I'm doing sangria. And mm. um, it's really good because I'll tell you what, when you get to those grapes at the bottom, boy, they are good. <laughs> Great. I've done right. it too on Pinot Noir too. I've done it with that wine. Sometimes Pinot Noir can be a little tart or bitter or something. Some of them are great. Some of them are a little bit off. And I'll throw my grapes in there just to kind of offset it a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. How about you, Terry? Are you drinking anything? Yes. I. Uh, my favorite is Argentine Malbec. And so that's what I have today. Um, my go-to, uh, of course, because some restaurants don't carry Malbecs is a uh, Cabernet, but Malbec okay. is my go-to. So Fantastic. hopefully, I'll, hopefully, I'll I'll be in Argentine in Argentina, sitting at a vineyard, eating and drinking all day. Oh, well, when you're when you're ready, Terry, I have a client down there who has a winery, and we're I'm working on building him a California winery too. But uh, if you if you want to go, stay in touch, and I'll introduce you to them. That sounds great. That's my, that's on my bucket list. <laughs> and we, our Global Chamber of Buenos Aires uh, chapter is run by Ricardo Vanella, who is uh, very, from a family that owns wineries and farmland and all sorts of things. And I actually, I was on the phone with him earlier today on a cannabis deal. So he's involved with all sorts of agriculture. So, uh, so let us know, both of you, uh, if you'd like to meet Ricardo. He is sure. amazing. He's extraordinary. Um, and anybody else on the call that has uh, a drink? I while I'm while we're waiting, while we're waiting, I'm drinking. My go-to drink is uh, Simi Winery. Um, I've been drinking the Cabernet from Simi for about ten years. It's I I just love it. It's like Doug Brunke. It's it's my my thing. And I <laughs> subsequently found out that it's made near Heldsburg. California, which my daughter was getting married there about three or four years ago. So we visited Heldsburg and it was like, wow, the, the Alexander Valley. I, it was like, I was getting really excited because it was like, this is where my wine is from. And we got to know Heldsburg uh, really well. And then the, the, um, the pandemic started and the, the place where they were getting married went out of business, uh, unfortunately, but I got to know Heldsburg a lot. They go there a lot. And Jeff, as you've been mentioning, Heldsburg, um, it's been bringing back a lot of memories that I haven't been there for two years. So I'm looking forward to going back. I know you've got some connections there. Yeah, I've been up there three times in the last couple of months, and I'll be there tomorrow. This is at hosting uh, 20 people from uh, four countries. So that'll be uh, fun. Um, by the way, see me, Val see me if you're interested. I, I do have a couple 70 cabs still around from see me. I think like a 70... We're on like a 76 drought here, see me cap maybe. Wow. Um, okay. So, you know, I need excuses to open up some of these wines, Doug. You know, okay. If, if, I, people, I, like, if you have an affinity for see me, I have one or two old see me still probably. I, yeah. I, I see a future meeting in our future. <laughs> Absolutely. Jeff, Jeff I, I need a 70, I need a 73 wine for a gift for somebody if you have one. I only have a handful, and they're the ones that come to mind are Ridge Zins, and they're sort of one of a kinds. And yeah, that, those are. The, I'm, by I'm the way, sure, prob I'm probably sure one of the best year for Ridge that great of a bottle. <laughs> Yeah, I was just looking because I'm visiting. I'm, I'm bringing an '89 Ridge Geyserville for. We're having a wine reception tomorrow at 5:30. If you want to come at Hillsburg, uh, that's why I'm bringing one bottle with me. Sure. Hey, but, 73, 73 was the best year ever especially in august because that's when i was born well happy oh, there we go 73 <laughs> birthday see well so yeah, 73 in california is... not a stellar year but for ridge zinfandels one of their best years i've had several recently and they're really? like off the holding their fruit super well amazing what do you terry, so, terry cotton is in austin and that's a that's a new wine area as well um and uh so yep. so Def definitely keep that in mind as well. Hey, uh, Cesar, sorry to take you off track here, but uh, and also Yuka, but uh, I thought it'd be beneficial if we got to see what everybody's drinking. Yeah, this is uh, this was great, and I, I I know that I'm not an expert. I'm just an aficionado. 
of wine. I mean, uh, I'm not going to talk about wine tonight, but I can talk about how we can go about wineries and wine business. How can we help them to export, to sell? You know, because, um, for example, uh, I'm dealing with a family business, which is uh, around 60 years old and family business, small family business. And after the crisis of um, financial crisis, they went like um, half of their production. So what I'm doing is by helping them to sell foreign countries, bring them back to their full production size. This is what I'm doing. And why, how so? I mean, why they choose not to expand in the national market? I don't know if anybody is aware or not, but in Spain, there is kind of nationalist, nationalism movement and Catalonia, where we are, um, is one of them. So every single time there's a there's a there's a politic there, there is a political issue, like um, central government is uh, pressuring the independence movement. There's boycott of Catalan Catalonia products. And the first one they go got is Catalonia wine. So they figured, this family business figured that this is a great idea to go beyond the borders, not in the national market. Right at this moment, 85% of their sales is in Spanish territories but we want to double the production, double the sales, or maybe double, uh, more than double the sales because I want to increase the, the price as well um, by going international. That's the reason why I'm there. And the first thing I did was to introduce this product in Japan because I'm Japanese, I know the market, and it's a very complicated market because um, distributions, the distribution system in Japan is very complicated. They make it complicated so that nobody is going to disturb them, the, 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 the interest they already have. But I successfully entered the market and now we are selling. And at this moment, this very moment, I'm getting some questions from the Japanese people. What kind of grapes are you using? What kind of production system you're using? What kind of procedure pro procedure you, uh, are you using? So there's a hope that I can expand the Japanese market. And I will, because the winery is trusting me and what I'm doing is not only the market expansion, I'm helping them to digitize their operation. Meaning all these people in Europe, not in the States, I believe, but in Europe, wine business is kind of rural business. So they're behind of all the IT advancement so i have to support how to use email safely how to put up the website how to improve the e-commerce how to promote the e-commerce how to do the social media campaigns all these so this is what i'm doing by digitizing the business going global because think about it the digital world doesn't have borders. It's international by default. 
And that's where I can play because I have all the experiences in the language industry. I can do digitization in any languages virtually. So that's what I'm doing. And if anybody is interested in how I go about this, I'm more than um, open to, to talk to you. I mean, there's no secret, there's no, you know, so please contact me, let's, let, let's talk. And um, that's what I wanted to say. Is it on time, Doug? It's perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I think, you know, as you, as you help those wine producers, then you would probably at some point need um, some legal help. And that's where we transition to, to Casey Branch. And, and Casey is a lawyer and, and I'm on, you know, many, many areas he covered, like entertainment and sports. I think his main focus is, is, is um, alcohol or liquor beverage and, and mm -hmm. wine is a so, Casey, um, can you give us five minutes and, and explain a little more about the, how you help your clients and, and what's the, the, the typical situation that any, any wine producer should have when it comes to, to global business? Well, in five minutes is difficult, but we'll try. <laughs> I've, already, I've already lost 30 seconds. <laughs> um, so people wonder, you know, why, why a wine lawyer? Most people have never even heard of wine lawyers. There's only a couple hundred of us in, in the world. And... It's number one, the subject of two constitutional amendments, the 18th Amendment and the 21st Amendment. Um, we have battles about the fact that it's a luxury item that needs to be taxed. The excise taxes that get collected by state government, federal government, local governments, all the rules and restrictions that has been established by this government post prohibition are amazing. And so what you have to understand about alcohol law relative to anything else is if it's not in the book, if it's not allowed in the book, then it is verboten. And it's basically an authoritarian way of looking at life. So as opposed to everything else where we have civil liberties and rights to do any things in the alcohol world, you must have a, a printed right to do it. There's no right to conduct the alcohol business. There's nothing. You have to get licensed and permitted and jump through a whole bunch of hoops. So it's a privilege, not a right. And if the book doesn't say you can do it, then you can't. And this is why there's no mention of social media and advertising in the book or anything else, because social media is just like advertising on the front page of the LA Times. So if it wasn't allowed on the front page of the LA Times, it's not allowed on social media. Um, and we have all these rules and restrictions in this country about how to sell wine. It's all about the sales of wine uh, and the rules and restrictions regarding that and the, and the three tier system, which is the producer, the distributor and the retailer. And while there have been some blending of that over the last few years, the idea is to keep them separate so there's no control. Because during prohibition, of course, there was lots of control by the uh, producers and the distributors and the retailers because they were all owned or operated or controlled by the mob. And the idea is to separate it out. And that's, that's something that in Europe is not the case because we have lots of what we call tide houses there, lots of um, bars and restaurants are owned by the very manufacturers of various alcohol. So in, in this country, it's all about protection of the consumer, whereas in Europe, it's not. And in Europe, you know, you can't grow Pinot Noir grapes in, in, in Bordeaux. Um, they have particular rules against that. But in terms of how to sell wine and things like that, it's, there is no restrictions on that. Uh, you ask about how what we do internationally, we deal with a lot of wine that's imported to this country. Um, we deal with a lot of, we're, right now we're dealing with several wineries who are established in their own countries. Uh, one's in Europe and one's in Argentina. And we're actually building California wineries for them. So they can then direct ship to uh, consumers in this country. They can ship to 45 states if they have that. But if they are an importer, they're not allowed to have their wine imported directly, they have to go through the, the three tier system and have it distributed. So it's a, it's a way that they can collect more of the, of the bottom line as opposed to paying off all of the middle people all the way through the process. So they can sell their wine direct to consumer, whereas you can't buy anything direct to consumer um, from imported wine. So that, that's what we're working on internationally. Uh, I'm also uh, working with a number of people who are foreigners who operate California wineries 
um, for whatever reason, or try to distribute their family wines here in California um, or across the country. Um, then I deal theoretically in a lot of ways with counterfeit wine law, which is a huge, huge thing. We just found um, a whole bunch of fake pen folds in China the other day. Um, there's all these investments in blockchains regarding investing in fine wine that we get involved with um, from an international basis. Most of that wine is kept in the UK. So it, it, it keeps me very, very busy. <laughs> so how's that for five minutes? That's perfect. And you know, that's a lot of things I, I didn't know and, and, and definitely things that make, you know, the, the trade of wine a little bit more complex for for the, you know, the simple winery in Argentina or Chile or whatever. So, so very interesting. And, and Casey, do, um, I know you're, you're have a trip to France and Italy. Can you comment a little bit about that? About what? I missed you. About your trip to, to France and Italy. Oh yeah. So I'm, up. I'm going to France and Italy. I'm going to teach at the university of Champagne for a few days, um, on American wine law, on the foundations of it, trade practices, how we can sell wine, what needs to be on what needs to be on labels, what can't be on labels. Uh, and then we'll delve into the whole counterfeit community and how we, how we find counterfeits and how that's really in, impacting the whole blockchain and investment catalogs. Um, when is it? Uh, that's gonna be in, in May. And, and then I'll be meeting when? with client in May in Champaign. Uh, when? Like- uh, First week uh, in May. First week in May. And then, uh, and then I'll be in Italy um, I'm going to miss Vin Italy, but I've got clients to see there as well, um, because they're talking about importing and getting their wines in, into the U.S., and they need to know how to do that and how to set up those operations, and, and I'll introduce them. And, and one of the things that I do is that not only do I practice law, but I practice networking in the community. So if somebody needs an importer, somebody needs a distributor, somebody needs a retailer, somebody needs a restaurant to sell the wine or put, put on a party or a winemaker dinner, um, I have the resources to introduce them um, across, across my network. Any chance you come to Spain, <laughs> departing I, from, from I, France and Italy? I was in Rioja about five, six years ago, uh, which was fabulous. Uh, and this trip, as close as I'll get to Rioja, is, uh, is bone. Yeah, uh, but you, you know, in, in Barcelona, this area, the, uh, it, I don't know if you know it, one of the, the gastronomic center of the world yes. is, is here. Yes. So please come. I will. Please it's on come. the list. Please come. Because I'm working with people who are working with Ferran, Ferran Adria. Mm -hmm. I, I am I Jake Ponte. I have a bottle right here. <laughs> yeah, so, so please come. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much, Casey. And, and you guys think it's, it's very, very interesting information that, that I personally didn't know about you know some complexities. I think we're we have five to ten more minutes, and I will welcome anyone who have any question or any additional comment. I will be putting the, the link to our meetup with Israel, which is just starting right right now, and we're going to be jumping to that meeting. So in case you want to join us as well, but is, does anyone has a, has a question or a comment? Uh, for KC, what are, from a trend perspective, what are you seeing? Um, what had been happening is that the wine industry had been branching out into Australia and different, like Southern Arizona has a wine industry now. Oh, yes. like all of I, have a, I have a bunch of clients in Southern Arizona. Like, but I mean, is, is that what's happening where like everywhere you can grow wine and people have kind oh. of discovered it? And what are the implications of that? Well, you can't grow what you can't. Yes, you can grow grapes anywhere. Uh, and just because you can make it doesn't mean you should. <laughs> um, and I've had uh, a lot of New Jersey wine that is uh, undrinkable. I'm sorry to those of you who, who are from or love New Jersey, uh, but I found that to be not very, not very good. Um, yep. and, and you talk about Terry being in, in Texas, the Texas wines are incredibly good, but they're not the typical varietals. You, they make terrible Chardonnay, terrible Sauvignon Blanc, terrible Cabernet, terrible Pinot Noir, but they do make some amazing Italian varietals. But the problem is, is that they don't sell because nobody's ever heard of them in Texas. So uh, all that sells are Chardonnays, Merlots, Cabs, all the stuff that, that people 
you know know the name of. But if if they sell it as a red blend and it has all this great Italian Italian varietals in it, it comes out amazing. And and people just need to branch out here and figure out a way to market the their the what works. Um, but you know the other thing is is you know a lot of people in Texas it's it's agritourism and it's it's much like Tem if you've ever been to Temecula and that area the wines down there are fine. Uh, but they're not great, but it's the whole experience. And that's what, that's what the Fredericksburg Hill Country is all about is, is an, is an agritourism experience, agritourism experience. And that's wonderful and great. But for, um, you know, the rest of the world, Texas wines are kind of a joke because those Italian varietals just don't get out there. Um, you know, when we talk about Arizona, Southern Arizona makes, you know, some of the most amazing Petit Verdot I've ever had, but that's, um, you know, once, once again, something that doesn't sell, um, you know, Washington, Oregon make great Pinot Noirs and great Merlots. Um, but then as you move east in the country, Michigan has a huge wine industry, but it's not very good, um, but it's better than most. Um, Virginia uh, has had some real successes with their Viognier, uh, which is a white wine varietal. Uh, and of course the Finger Lakes of, of, New, of New York with the sweeter yep. wines, that's been very successful. But beyond that, even though every state in this country, including Alaska and Hawaii, uh, have grapes from there, have, have wine made from grapes grown in those places, it doesn't mean it's very good. We had a case involving um, the uh, name Denali, which is a um, um, national park, of course, up, up in North, and the uh, U.S. Uh, trademark office said, well, people might think that the wines come from Denali in the national park. And we had to say, that's really not possible. That's called a geographic origin. Uh, and it, it's not possible to have grapes there. And in fact, yes, Alaska grows them in a hothouse in Anchorage, which is about a thousand miles away. And the average temperature is about negative four. So I don't think anybody's going to really believe that these grapes came from uh, Denali National Park, which of course is a newer name for what used to be McKinley. Um, so we, we won that, but the idea is, is that yes, every, every state in the country does grow grapes. It just doesn't make great wine from those grapes. And a lot of, a lot of wineries will import California, Washington, Oregon grapes to their, um, to their facility and bottle and make wine from those grapes. Uh, but the labeling requirements are pretty severe. Normally you'd have to label them, you know, North American or American wine, even though the grapes may have come from Santa Barbara. And once again, that gets back to the labeling restrictions. Yeah, that's actually someone from, from, from Puerto Rico told me the other day that her uncle makes wine. And it was a surprise because we don't, we don't grow any in the grapes. Well, um, I'll add Puerto yeah. Rico in my list. Now it's 51 states. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but well, yeah, he's bringing the, the grapes and making the, the wine locally. So. And, and you can make, going back to prohibition, you can make 200 gallons of wine without paying taxes. So even big wineries, as long as they're LLCs, can not pay taxes on the first 200 gallons of wine per LLC member. So if you happen to be in a winery that has a whole bunch of LLC members, um, all those people get their wine tax free. But if it's a corporation, they don't get them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Perfect. Any, any other last question or comment? Yuka, do you have any? any yeah, so sorry. Yeah, yeah, I do have a comment. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I saw in the chat box, I don't see um, Jeff Dare. Is that saying D A A R? Dar. Up dark. Dar. I don't see him up there anymore. He's gone. He had to leave. Okay. But in the chat, he made a very important comment. I think not right now, but I think for the future, it might be a great topic. He talked about the type of glasses to drink certain wines from. Um, I understand that, absolutely. And so many of us uh, trade off the white wine and do, do a multi-purpose glass. This is considered multi-purpose, red, white, or water, whichever you wanna prefer. And also the manner in which you hold the glasses, which is something I teach is, is so important. It's like, you know, this is a tulip I'm prepared. You hold it by the stem, you hold wine by the stem, not by the bloom. <laughs> so, you know, is, things isn't like- Isn't it amazing, <laughs> Gory, isn't it amazing how many people hold their glasses wrong? Even oh, in the I movies, see this on TV all the in time. The TVs. It's, oh, like, I know. It's, it's like, it's not beer. It's not right. beer. It's wine. <laughs> it drives me crazy. <laughs> but, but, but I think a, a topic like that, Cesar, might be interesting, just the, all the different glasses. And I, the one, um, Casey, I hate when I go to order wine and they order, they give you that glass that doesn't have a stem. Oh, yes. I hate mm. that glass. 
But anyway, you know, what's going on in the in the wine glass world? Well, yes. And, and so I don't know if any of you have ever done the Riedel tasting, but they, they have like 16 different glasses, one for each one. This is actually the Riedel Pinot glass that mm -hmm. I'm drinking Pinot out of. And I grabbed it especially for yeah. this occasion. <laughs> but so what is um, the wine really does taste different in the yeah. different glasses. And, and it really shocked me when you actually compared them and you drank the same wine from different glasses and how differently it, it hits the palate. Um, and, 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 and glass versus crystal. That's another oh, yes. one too. Um, um, but so, we, could pandemic, go off a, <laughs> we could go off on a tangent here, but Cesar, um, make that a consideration. I think that would be a very interesting Zoom. But does everyone else uh, like that idea? Yes, yes, yes. I loved it. I loved it, Gloria. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I would do it. Yeah, I would go for it. So okay. please, Cesar, and, and let's that. Let's do it. And then yeah, during, the, during the pandemic, I traveled a lot. So I was in hotels a lot and they got rid of all their glassware. So all they had was plastic. So yeah. I decided it was better to drink out directly out of the bottle than it was to put it in a plastic. <laughs> yeah. <bottle. laughs> okay. There could be great stories to go with that too. So I think exactly. that would be a good yeah. one. <laughs> Do you have a oh my God, this is great. I'd like to see that. <laughs> but I, I remember being in northern Spain one time at, and across from the hotel, this woman came home. Where you, you were, you know, in Spain, it's tight quarters. So you kind of watch everybody what they're doing. And this woman came in, took, took most of her clothes off and just opened a bottle of wine and just started. Going, what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what? <laughs> she left a little bit on to leave a little bit to the design, to, you know, to what, to the modesty of it all. But she just came in and just. Mm -hmm. popped out you know took took most of her clothes off and just sat there and drank her bottle of wine right out of, right out of the bottle <laughs> wow wow uh -huh. wow but it, 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 this was very interesting thank you very very much Doug and Cesar to organize this I continue the journey with all the people who are here and really thank you no, thank, you. thank, thank you, you, Yuka, and thank KC and everyone else who joined us. I didn't, I didn't get back from Marinella, but I think we can definitely continue with the wine slash alcohol type of, of, of meetups for sure. So, so Doug, any any final comments? Yeah, no. Let's let's circle back with Marinella because she's a wine expert in that part of the world, Romania and Bulgaria, kind of the, in the Baltics. And she just brings a, just a, a spice to it. And I love the protocol idea. That, that's all awesome. I, I do want to share something that I remembered in the last week. It was a, an entrepreneur, and I, I'm going to have to dig out his name, but he started the Brandy Winery. And so the Brandy Wine River is the main river that runs through Delaware. So he called it the Brandy Winery. I don't know why they call it the Brandywine River, but it was the first winery in the Wilmington, Delaware area. It actually was across the border in Pennsylvania. So it has it has a little bit of a Joe Biden feel to it. It's a little bit southwest of where Joe Biden lives, but kind of in that area, much closer to where I have lived in Chester County, Pennsylvania. So, so that's how I got connected to this fellow. He retired from General Electric in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, took all of his retirement money invested in a winery that no one had ever built in an area where no one had ever built a winery so he for several years took grapes from the erie county west near buffalo and used those in in his wine and then finally the the i take several years three to five years for the wine the grapes to grow to a level where he could actually use in his wine so so he was amazing to speak with and uh, turned out he gave wine classes and he had a like a big bump on his head and, and we ended up getting to know him and I found out he had cancer. So he was basically through all of his money and all of his passion in his retirement years into this winery. And he was amazing to see him how joyful he was to walk the fields and how that what that meant to him. Long story short, the winery failed. He died of cancer. It was horrible. Now, the, now here's the positive part of it. There's over 20 wineries in that area now, including the area that he was. He was before his time, but he did, well, before he died, he did pass away happy. <laughs> and he was, and I can say he was like the happiest guy I think I ever met. 
in what he was doing. And so whatever you're doing, be happy. I'll leave you with that and drink plenty of wine. And KC, hey, I just love the love what you shared today. You are so knowledgeable about every kind of wine. I loved when you went through state by state. I don't know if you've been drinking any of those southeastern Pennsylvania wines. I don't think I've ever had a southeastern Pennsylvania wine. <laughs> okay. And that's that's the area, but the Brandy Wine River in Delaware. Oh, I've heard of that. Yes. The, uh, probably nothing on the Delaware side of the border, but on the Pennsylvania side, Lancaster County. Yes, I know the, that County. Pennsylvania is where the Amish are, and that's all kind of lumped in together. I'll bet there's probably some really good wines there. So next time, definitely let me know if, if you find anything that's decent there. I will do that. Okay, very good. Thanks, you know, everybody. And, and on that note, oh. it's interesting because when I travel, I like to go to local restaurants and order local wine. And, you know, but they only have California wine or Washington wine. And, and they say, well, you know, nobody wants to buy our local wine. And it's like, well, that's tragic. You're there. You want the flavor of it. I mean, I don't exactly. care if it's good or bad. I want the experience of it uh, to have their local wine. And, and, and it's, it's sad that they can't, that the restaurants aren't able to sell the local wine. Yeah, that, that's not right. Uh, definitely not right. He was able to make some wines. There were some bad ones, but there were some good ones as well. And so why not? So check right. that out. Chester County, Lancaster County, those areas, uh, undoubtedly, there's there's probably more than more than one. And there's at least, uh, like I said, at least 20 of them that I've researched. Uh, just really extraordinary. Thanks, everybody. I uh, hope you hope to see you in the Tel Aviv meeting. Let's behave ourselves, though, if you jump Thanks. in. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Let's just jump into there. Thank Cheers. you, guys. Casey and everything else. Juka. Cheers.